My name is Susan Pond. I'm honoured as President of the Royal Society of New South Wales to introduce Richard Trethowen, Professor of Plant Breeding and Director of the Plant Breeding Institute in the Sydney Institute of Agriculture at the University of Sydney. We acknowledge the tradition of custodianship and law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. We pay our respects to those who have cared and continue to care for country. The Royal Society of New South Wales has been charting the evolution of intellectual thought in Australia for 200 years. It is a nexus of ideas and discovery that challenges us to think differently, analyse the latest research, discuss debate and understand some of the major issues confronting humanity. National and global agronomic challenges represent one such major issue. It is in this field that Richard Trithowan excels. His excellence in the field of plant genetics and breeding is the reason why he was awarded the Society's 2021 Poggendorf Lectureship. This lecture was established to honour Walter Hans Poggendorf, known to his colleagues as Pog. He was a brilliant biologist and plant breeder, recognised as one of the central figures in establishing the Australian rice industry and a range of other commercial crops such as peaches, apricots, pears, almonds, grapes and rock melons. In 1928, while still very young, Pogendorf uh, selected the first of the Pure Line rice varieties to be bred at the Yanko Rice Research Institute near Leeton. For many years, he worked as the chief of the Division of Plant Industry in the New South Wales Department of Agriculture. When he died in 1981, Poggendorf made a bequest to the Society to establish the Poggendorf Lecture. Professor Richard Trithowen is the ninth person to receive the award. Richard received his certificate earlier this year from the patron of the Society, Her Excellency the Honourable Margaret Beasley AC Casey, in a ceremony at Government House in Sydney. Now he has the opportunity to present the lecture itself. Richard has published widely on most aspects of plant breeding and has authored or co-authored close to 200 reviewed, peer-reviewed articles. He has led many national and international initiatives, including highly successful programs in the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Centre. This centre links Australian and international wheat and barley breeding initiatives for the benefit of Australian farmers and farmers across the globe. Richard's 2021 Poggendorf Lecture is entitled a plant breeder's perspective on food security and climate change. Welcome, Richard. Well, thank you, Susan, very much for those kind words. And let me respond by thanking the Royal Society of New South Wales for considering me for the Poggendorf Lectureship. As we've just heard, Poggendorf was a plant breeder and I've been a plant breeder for all my professional career. And as such, uh, this award does hold very special significance for me. Now, today, I wanted to talk about a couple of issues that I think we all have opinions on. And I want to look at these two issues, food security and climate change, th through the lens of an agricultural science scientist, a plant breeder in particular. When I started out as a plant breeder many years ago, back in the late 1980s, the overarching goal was productivity. Productivity at almost any cost. It's now, the overarching goal is now a little more nuanced. It's productivity, sure, but we need to do it sustainably and profitably. So that's a little more complex than it used to be. 
let me say it is quite easy in reality to, to achieve sustainable productivity, but to make that profitable is another thing altogether. To do that, to achieve that overarching objective, we need to optimise this interaction. We need the right genetics, along with optimised management practices in the right environment, producing the right product that consumers actually want. If we can optimise that, we will achieve that objective of sustainable and profitable productivity. Now, that interaction, in reality, represents the breadth of disciplines in agricultural science. From the plant breeder to the agronomist, the soil scientist, the climate scientist, and the cereal chemist and all points in between. Because I'm a plant breeder, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the genetics today, but I just want to highlight the fact that what we do as plant breeders is not in isolation. It's always with all of these elements of the interaction in mind. We'll, if we don't work together in multidisciplinary teams, if we're not aware of the system in which we work, we will never achieve that overarching objective. Now, what a recap a little and think about the Green Revolution. There, were, there has probably never been a more successful event in the history of agriculture than the Green Revolution, apart from maybe the domestication of those first crops. This new genetics and associated improved agronomic practice doubled cereal yields in Asia in a very short period. It's often um, understood that the Green Revolution sort of spans the period, the mid-1960s to the end of the century or the turn of the century. And in that time, we saw tremendous progress all around the world, not just in South Asia, but in Australia and in many other environments. Productivity went through the roof. It was a quantum change. And that came about through the introduction of these short statured wheat and rice varieties. Prior to that, if you have a look at that bottom panel there, my colleague Harbin's Variana standing in a field of pre-green pre revolution wheat. You can barely see him there. So when you put nitrogen on a wheat like that, when those conditions are more productive, it'll fall over and therefore destroy the yield. Introducing those short statured varieties allowed farmers to put more nitrogen into the system. That's a very important agronomic intervention. It allowed productivity. It, because these new wheats and rices, rice had higher harvest index, it allowed them to push up the yields to much higher levels. Alongside of that, photo period insensitivity was also introduced. And that allowed these short statured wheats to be grown much closer to the equator where very big populations in developing countries were deriving a lot of their calories from wheat and rice. And because I've been a wheat breeder for much of my career, I'm going to concentrate on wheat in the rest of this presentation. That was so successful that at the end of the 20th century, there was 25, the, the food supplies were estimated to be 25% higher per person than at the inception of the Green Revolution. And that's at a time when pop, human population was increasing rapidly. So what an incredible achievement that was. However, as with all innovations, with all quantum changes, there are some un, unintended consequences as well. And what I've shown here is the change in cereal production over time, over the period of the Green Revolution, compared to pulse production. And you'll see that in South Asia and in developing countries as a whole, there was a massive increase in the production of cereals. But that was at the expense of the production of pulses or legumes. So while people had more to eat and since the Green Revolution, there has never been a widespread famine. While people have plenty to eat, the nutritive value of their food changed because pulses are a rich source of protein and minerals and vitamins. And what that has led to is fairly widespread malnutrition in many environments. And you can see across South Asia in particular, Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Latin America, lots of iron, zinc, and vitamin A deficiencies. 
And that's largely coming from an imbalance in diet because we simply don't have enough pulses in, in the diet. Now, we know that malnutrition leads to all sorts of health issues, and you can, I've listed some of those there. I think they're fairly clear. But what's really interesting is that malnutrition also affects GDP, and it's estimated that there's a 5% annual loss in GDP, G, GDP in South Asia due to malnutrition. At the moment, it's estimated that around about 2 billion people in the world suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. It's a phenomenal problem. Now, is this a direct consequence of the Green Revolution? It's hard to say. There are so many other potential factors that influence this. But it's a challenge for us all going into the, into the, uh, the coming years. The Green Revolution is also running out of puff. It finished, it's generally accepted that it finished at the turn of the century. And what I've done there is map global wheat yield, whoops, global wheat yield against Australian average wheat yields. And the first thing you'll notice is that wheat's, that the yield globally is a lot higher and that's because wheat is grown under irrigation or in, or in ir irrigation or high rainfall conditions in many other countries. In Australia, we grow wheat under rain-fed conditions. It's a fairly hostile environment, hence our yields are lower. The second thing to note is that this line is plateauing. The change or the advance in yield is plateauing, and that started around about the turn of the century, and it's been continuing. The third thing to note, notice is that in Australia, our environment is becoming more variable since the turn of the century. I've just circled some of the drought years, but you can see they're interspaced with some very good years as well. So our production environment is becoming increasingly unstable. That is a significant challenge. So what are the challenges post the Green Revolution? We have this plateauing in yield. We need to try and break that yield barrier one way or another. We have a more hostile production environment to work in in many regions. And that's a picture from Walgett, the 2006 drought, a farmer's field. And you can see that's not going to yield very much. Lots of spatial variation in that field. We need to maintain productivity, but we need to do that with fewer inputs. That is all about sustainability. That's about sustainable productivity. And that's a real challenge. There will be changing disease patterns. As temperatures change, as moisture patterns change, diseases, disease expression will change. We'll see new diseases on old crops. Malnutrition is really now the objective rather than alleviating hunger. I think that's fairly obvious. And we still have our overarching um, objective of making productivity both sustainable and profitable. These are significant challenges for all agricultural scientists and not just the plant breeder. But what has changed since the Green Revolution? What, what good things and bad things have, have happened? And I think adoption of conservation agriculture has been a real game changer in many environments over the last 20 years. That's been pretty widely adopted in many developed countries, particularly those with broad scale agriculture. Conservation agriculture is simply a situation where you don't till the soil, you retain crop residues from the previous crop on the soil surface, you reduce erosion, you reduce moisture loss. You'll often hear Australian farmers talk about farming moisture. Well, that's what they're doing with conservation agriculture. It hasn't been adopted widely in developing countries, and part of that is the high cost in setting it up. You need uh, significant investment in machinery and the small scale of the farming operations in those countries. Although many have tried, and there is a push to try and get conservation agriculture operating in some key um, developing countries. We have now a suite of new technologies available. We have new genetics. Microsisted selection now is routine. I remember when I started out as a plant breeder, they identified the first RFLP to talk probably another 20 years before they were effectively used. We, we had effective markers to use in plant breeding. It's now routine. Genomic selection, 
is now becoming commonplace. Well, relatively, but people are starting to adopt genomic selection. Transgenesis, we know that is available as a tool, even though there are regulatory restrictions around its use, gene editing. How can we use that to change the expression of traits? We can assess phenotypes. When I say phenotype, I mean the plant response. We can do that very easily now, relatively easily, using proximal and remote sensing. And data management and analysis has completely changed. Machine learning is now available. Lots of technologies. But the danger is, and I think for all we scientists, the danger is to become fixated on the technology and forget about the overarching objective. And I even see this with funding bodies these days, where it is more about how can we fit this technology? Where can we fit this? We need to think about what we want to achieve. Then how do we adapt all these tools that are available? How do we use them effectively? If we can use them to get to that objective faster and more effectively, then we will. We need to use it. The intellectual property environment has changed. In wheat, we now have endpoint royalties in place. There's a lot of investment, a lot of value in wheat breeding. Hence, wheat breeding is now in the commercial sector. When I started out as a young plant breeder many years ago, I'd go to national meetings and in my pocket, I'd have a packet of seed of my latest new breakthrough and we'd swap seed and we'd swap ideas and all that sort of stuff. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, now everything is tied up with material transfer agreements and licensing arrangements that outline how you can and cannot use the line. In many cases, you can't access the diversity at all. But what this has done is bring much more investment into plant breeding. So there's so much more investment in wheat breeding, for example, than there used to be because you can derive value from your intellectual property. Biodiversity laws have also slowed things down as well. Uh, many countries now consider the genetics within their borders to be sovereign and uh, will not share it. So the days when you could run around the world plant collecting um, basically are gone. Biosecurity, here in Australia, we've always considered, we've always been aware of biosecurity, the dangers of foreign disease incursions. Many other countries now are, are aware of the issues as well. So it's become increasingly hard even to send people seed because they have so many restrictions. So the flow of genes, in a sense, of diversity has slowed around the world. And after all, we plant breeders, we, we survive on access to diversity. It's critical to the work we do. But what has been positive, I think, over the last 20 years has been the rise of multidisciplinary teams. Science is moving so quickly, it's so big, there's so much to do, you cannot do it yourself. You cannot keep around the changes in technology. You've got to work with others. I'm part of a large number of multidisciplinary teams, all with different objectives, and they're really, really rewarding. And that's one there, that picture of a multi-country, multidisciplinary team in Pakistan looking at implementing a new technology in that environment. So what I'd like to do is explore some of this by looking at three examples, three examples of research that I've been involved in. The first one is targeting new genetic diversity, absolutely key. The second, managing high temperatures. And the third, all about introducing a brand new technology. That's hybridity or hybrid wheat. And I'll explain what I mean by that a little later. So let's look first at targeting genetic diversity. And what I've shown you there is some of the breadth of diversity that is available in wheat. Over here, we have a wheat that stays green. It never matures. And on the other side, a very short statured wheat with a big spike that many people thought might be the answer to breaking the yield plateau. Sadly, it hasn't turned out to be that way. But it shows you some of the diversity that is available in the wheat gene pool that we can work with. This is a collaboration with Majib Kazi from the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Centre, or CIMIT for short. Majib is probably one of the, the world's most renowned um, crop cytogeneticist, and it was my pleasure to work with him for many years. Matthew Reynolds, again, a fantastic wheat physiologist at CIMIT. Uh, Barbara Atta, a PhD student here at the University of Sydney who helped progress this work. And Tariq Chatter, a research fellow who was involved in the work. Now, in order to exploit diversity, we need to think about how our crops arose. This applies whether you're breeding sweet potatoes or wheat. We need to understand how these crops evolved. 
<clears throat> wheat came about, wheat is actually a fusion of three species. It's a fusion of three species. The first cross that gave rise to wheat occurred about 10,000 years ago. And that was a cross between Triticum aratu and Spiltoides. And that resulted, because they're different species, that resulted in a sterile individual. The chromosomes spontaneously doubled. Why? We don't know, but they did. <coughs> Producing a, a balanced meiosis. And out of that arose emma wheat. And emma wheat is the precursor of durum wheat or pasta wheat as we know it today. So through mutation and farmer selection, we've ended up here with durum wheat. However, about 8,000 years ago, this wild emma then crossed with goat grass or Agelops tauchii. The same thing happened. A sterile hybrid was produced, the chromosomes spontaneously doubled, and lo and behold, we have bread wheat as we know it today. So basically all the diversity that we have in the wheat gene pool largely came through these low probability events that occurred thousands of years ago. These were very, very important events because these chance events led to the spread of farming and the establishment of civilizations. Very important events. Now, when I think about using diversity, I always do the easy things first. I always say this, say this to students as well. I think sometimes intellectually you want to do the complex, do the easy. If you can find the trait you want in an adapted background, it's so much easier getting that into a package that you can release to farmers. Look in the adapted gene pool. If you can't find it in, in the adapted cultivars, go to the land races. The land races are unimproved farmer varieties that farmers have selected for hundreds of years. And if you can't find it there, go to the precursor species that, that, that all years ago led through hybridization to wheat as we know it. And that is what we call the primary gene pool. I wouldn't step into the secondary or tertiary gene pools unless I was absolutely desperate, because here we have only partial homology or no homology at all with the wheat genome. And even with all our genetic tools that we have available these days, exploiting that diversity is so much more difficult. So again, always do the easy things first. That is a field in Syria. In the days when one could travel to Syria, and I've found in that field, the wild emma and goat grass together in that field growing. 8,000 years after that chance event, that led to bread wheat, the production of bread wheat. Now think about it. That initial cross probably only involved a few plants at most, and all that diversity that we work with today came out of that chance of them. Here in this field, 8,000 years later, those species are still there. They've survived. Drought, heat, frost, floods, war, anything and everything, and they're still there. And we thought, well, just Imagine the genes for stress resistance that have, are accumulated in that material that we've not exploited in wheat. So many years ago, we went and made this in the laboratory. We took Triticum durum or wild emma, we did both, crossed that onto Agelops tauchii or goat grass, produced a sterile hybrid, doubled the chromosomes using culture scene to promote the doubling, and we ended up with a primary Synthetic, we call this synthetic wheat. It's not really, we're just doing, it's an awful name really. But it is, it is all we're doing is, is generating or duplicating what happened in nature all those years ago. I then took this primary synthetic, crossed it onto adapted cultivars. There's a lot of agronomic, it was awful. We were only after the stress tolerance genes and developed some really interesting lines. That's a picture of me from more than 20 years ago and you can see I've hardly changed. <laughs> Here I am standing in the Sonoran Desert. Now the Sonoran Desert, wheat in the Sonoran Desert is grown using irrigation. And I've got my hand on one of our new synthetic derivatives we, where we took that diversity and introduced it into an adapted cultivar. That adapted cultivar is there, it's dying. So we were able to achieve this adaptation. I hope you can see that by introducing this brand new diversity into the wheat pool. 
When I came back to the University of Sydney, I brought some of these materials with me. And a student, Barbara Atta, developed some new lines. And what we did was take Australian cultivars and create synthetic derivatives of those cultivars. And in this case, we were looking for enhanced water use efficiency. So along the x-axis here, you see water use efficiency. This is kilograms of grain produced per millimeter available water. And we were able to significantly improve the water use efficiency of the, of the adapted material here in Australia through the introduction of this diversity. To date, there's more than 60 wheat cultivars containing this diversity released around the world, and that's increasing exponentially as more and more people cross these derivatives. It's, it's really useful diversity. Now I want to talk about what we're doing secondly to manage high temperatures. And that synthetic diversity, by the way, has ended up in here in this effort as well, because we've found some wonderful levels of heat tolerance in that new diversity. This is a collaboration with many people. Matthew Reynolds from CIMIT, again, um, I'll talk a little bit about an early collaboration. And more recently, we have a genomic selection program that has a number of partners, Rebecca Sisselthwaite from the university. She manages our field program. Daniel Tan um, oversees our controlled environment testing. We have a team from Agriculture Victoria, Hans Datweiler, Rem Jukadar, Jocelyn Tibbetts. They're all computational biologists. And more recently, the Department of Primary Industries in Western Australia has joined the team and a private company, Intergrain. This picture, by the way, I took in north, northwestern China, up in Xinjiang, where they grow wheat around oases at some pretty high temperatures. And on that day, if you can see that, that was 58 degrees there. That was a pretty warm environment. So we know, and this is from lots of testing at Narrabri in northwestern New South Wales. The university has a major research station there. We, we've been testing wheat at different times of sowing for nearly a decade now. And based on that and all the environmental evidence that we've been able to collect, we estimate that for every one degree rise in average maximum seasonal temperature above the optimum, we lose up to 400 kilograms of yield, anywhere between 250 and 400 kilograms of yield. It's, it is significant. We see that heat shock, if that occurs during the flowering period, you get fewer grains. If you get heat during the grain filling period, that's post flowering when the seed is filling, you'll get lighter grains or reduced grain weight. <clears throat> Different genetic systems are operating to provide tolerance to both those stresses. And the inheritance of heat is highly complex. Our heat tolerance is highly complex. So many years ago, about 20 years ago, <laughs> um, I got together with Matthew Reynolds, physiologist at CIMIT, and we decided to design crosses using physiological traits. Now, 20 years ago, physiologists were much maligned by, by plant breeders. The plant breeder would develop the high yielding line. The physiologist would take that, go away, and several years later come back and tell the breeder why it was high yielding, and the game had moved on. And we thought, let's change that. Let's flip it around and get physiology involved in the beginning of the breeding process. So Matthew, characterized all my parental materials for a suite of physiological traits. We sat down and made crosses that combined these traits. We then derived lines through empirical selection under stress. He confirmed which of those lines actually had combined traits and off they went to testing. We later tested that material across multiple locations in South Asia and Mexico. And what I've shown here, this is yield on the top axis. These are conventionally bred materials. These are physiologically designed materials. And what you'll note here is that the physiologically designed materials were significantly higher. It really works. It really does work. We're still doing this, but the game also has moved on. Oh, we've also released uh, 12 cultivars that I've been able to identify so far out of that work. Now the game has moved on. And these days we now, uh, we're now integrating genomic selection in our breeding work, breeding and pre-breeding work. 
And what that has allowed us to do is exploit, is, is to optimize, I should say, this equation. This is the rate of genetic advance. And as plant breeders, we want to be always increasing that rate of genetic advance in any trait that we're working with. That will get us elite products and to farmers faster. But that is a, a genetic advance is a function of the selection intensity. So how strongly do we truncate a population? The selection accuracy, the additive variance, which is basically that portion of total variance, which is genetic. And we divide that by the length of the breeding cycle. That's the time from making a cross to identifying the elite line with the characteristics you want. What we've been able to do is reduce T significantly because we now make crossing decisions on the basis of genotype. So it's genetics rather than its phenotype, its response. And that has reduced the cycle time. We've lost a little bit in accuracy because we're doing that, but we have more than made up for that with the reduced cycle time. And we are moving faster now. We're making so much progress. However, genomic prediction is completely dependent upon a really accurate phenotype. At the beginning of the process, you need to have a very accurate phenotype or assessment of that plant response. So we've done that and it has to be relevant. It really must be relevant. Otherwise, you're, you, can always you can always predict something, but whether or not it comes to pass depends on just what you base that on. So we decided to develop a three-teed system for phenotyping wheat for high temperature tolerance. In this system, we start with large numbers of lines in the field. We plant thousands of lines in large plots in the field at Narrabri in times of sowing experiments. If we sow late, we expose those lines to high temperature. We identify subsets of lines out of that that appear to have heat tolerance. We then go to step two. And in step two in the following year, we plant them in the field optimally on an optimal planting date. And then we apply stresses using field-based heat chambers, runoff generators. And we have a large number of these now. That is to make sure that what we have seen is not just an artifact of late sowing, it really is heat tolerance. If it passes that, it'll end up with Daniel in the greenhouse, where we look at the traits involved under highly controlled conditions. As a result, we wanted a few groups to report a correlation between the greenhouse and the field. Most people tend to go the other way. They start in the greenhouse and end up in the field, but this has really worked well for us. As we go along, particularly in this initial phase, we phenotype, but also genotype the material. By genotyping, that's a very dense DNA fingerprint, if you like. We then associate the phenotype and the genotype to calculate genomic estimated breeding values. So our breeding value is simply the sum of all the additive genetic effects for a particular line. And we then move these, we then take subsets of lines on the basis of those GEBVs, and we test them at key locations in other parts of Australia to see whether what we're doing in Narrabri can translate to other locations. More recently, we've extended that to other locations in the west and the south, and even up here at Kununurra, now you're probably wondering, what is a site doing up there in Kununurra? No one grows wheat in Kununurra, it's far too hot, but there is irrigation there. And we, if you look at the climate models, if you look at all the climate models, the most dire predictions suggest that Kununurra may well be Queensland and Northern New South Wales in the future. So if once we identify this genetics that we believe has all this heat tolerance, we take it up there to really test it out. If it survives Kununurra, then we know it's pretty good. We also have a fourth step now. And because we're working with a commercial company, because we have a commercial company as a partner in this, any all the, the lines that go through all of that and with the, have these high genetic values are then tested at 35 locations around Australia in the real environment in their trials. So we can really, really road test the material and get it to farmers faster. That is essential. In season, we measure a number of things. We measure phenology, flowering time, because that is very much related to yield. 
plants' heights, disease incidence, but we also measure spectral reflectance. So basically, we're looking at uh, NDVI. We're measuring, we're using sensor, sensor technology to look at biomass and greenness and canopy temperature, which is really, really an important trait. So the difference between the ambient temperature and the temperature in the canopy is an indication that that plant is managing the stress well or not. We used to run around with handheld sensors. We used to have students in the field running around with handheld sensors. But there's a lot of error in those data because the environmental conditions changed through the day, introduced a lot of error. The operators became tired and you could almost map the tiredness in the error in the data. So these days, we capture all those data using drones. So cameras mounted on drones. Many people are doing this. This is an example of, of one of those images. Each one of these little segments here is a 12 square meter plot made up of thousands of pixels. We then convert that into a mean and standard error and use that to promote our selection program. At the end of the season, we go into those plots and we harvest them. We assess grain yield, grain weight, screenings, which is the percentage of small shriveled grain, um, which is an indication that the line has not been managing stress well. Protein and test weight, that's basically just the weight of a litre of grain, very important to the milling industry, for example. We then integrate all of that in a single index. All of those data go into the index and we weight that index. And then we calculate our breeding values on the basis of that index. And the weighting changes by year, but basically we look at the total variance in a trait and if much of that variance is genetic, it gets a high weighting. If not, it gets a low weighting, for example. Now, I was, I sort of, I'm denied about showing a plant breeding scheme. <laughs> Most people don't like seeing plant breeding schemes. I've shown this because it is so radically different. This is a wheat breeding scheme. Five, 10 years ago, you would not have seen this. This is very different to what wheat breeders normally do. So we start with these large training populations, those thousands of lines at Narrabri. They're phenotype, they're genotype, genetic values are calculated. On the basis of those genetic values, we go into cycles of recombination. By recombination, I mean crossing. We cross high GBV with high GBV if the lines are diverse. We then go through cycles of recombination. So we derive progenies, and then cross again, derive progenies, genotype them, calculate GBVs and cross again. So we get, this is how we get the cycle time down, right? No longer are we phenotyping. We're just making decisions on the genetics, nothing else. At the same time, the very best lines go off for national testing. I'm running out of battery there, up in validation. And the correlation between the genomic estimated breeding value and its actual performance is our genomic prediction accuracy. We always want to get that as high as we can. The lines with high GBVs go back to the training population, and the best ones head off for commercial testing. That is a brand, that is a modern plant breeding, wheat breeding scheme. So where are we then with things? Um, we've calculated GBVs on about seven thousand elite materials now that we've developed. I've just shown a summary of this. Uh, what I've what I've shown here. Uh, the, the orange bars represent the GBVs under heat. The blue bars represent the GBVs under optimal un, or un, unstressed conditions. And I've compared our best new material with the Australian cultivars. All of these on the bottom here are the elite Australian cultivars that are being produced, that are being grown by farmers today. And what you can see is the genetics for high temperature tolerance. We've made a lot of progress there. We've got these lines with really high genetic values. And what's really pleasing are the blue bars because we've lost nothing in terms of yield under optimal conditions. That's important because a farmer doesn't have hot conditions every year. Take this year, for example. If the conditions are not hot, that farmer will still reap a good yield. That's what we want. If conditions are hot, that yield is buffered through this new genetics. That's been our aim. So what happens when we take that to Kalanara up in the north? I've uh, represented uh, the, the data here as a percentage of the trial mean across two locations in Kalanara. And you can see that our heat tolerant lines are much better than just about all of the Australian cultivars. 
this is working and it's working really well. That's one tough environment. And we're seeing that genetics hold up. So we're very much encouraged. That new material, and there's a lot of it because we're a university now. We don't, as a university, we don't release cultivars anymore. But we might in the future, who knows? But at the moment, we don't. So we give that material to commercial breeding companies. All the commercial companies have accessed this material. They've seen these results. It's in their commercial pipelines. We'll see this genetics out in farmers' fields fairly soon. And now I want to finish with the benefits of hybridity or hybrid wheat. And in the centre of that picture, that's one of our new wheat hybrids. You can see lots of biomass, hybrid vigour growing in the field. Well, it's not growing anymore. It's at harvest, but in the field up at North Star. This is a collaboration among a number of people. Peng Zhang, who's our cytogeneticist. Um, Chong Mei Dong, she is our molecular biologist on the project. Jianbo Li, who's a cytogeneticist who recently joined the team. Isabella Ravel, a student who is helping us unravel the genetics of hybridity or hybrid vigor. Nizam Ahmed has helped us with the crossing, Harbans Bariana on assessment of the rush resistance of our hybrids, and Jakob Lager and Nick Bird from KWS, who have helped us access additional funding for this work. I also want to acknowledge Norman Darby, an academic here at the university. Sadly, Norman passed away in 2017, but the concept of a genetic system, and this is a genetic system, the concept of a genetic system for making hybrids was his. And he developed the prototype materials that allowed us to be where we are today. So we owe Norman a tremendous debt of gratitude there. Now, what is a wheat hybrid? If we have two end bread lines, so what is a hybrid? Two, two end bread lines, you cross those two end bread lines, the first cross progeny will exhibit or may exhibit, not always, but may exhibit heterosis or hybrid vigor. If you allow that first cross progeny to self-pollinate, that disappears, right? So we want to take advantage of that first cross advantage. Now, wheat is self-pollinated, it's really hard. If you want to make a cross, you've got to do what this person's doing, get out a pair of tweezers, pull apart the blooms, remove all the anthers, come back later when the stigma's mature and has developed and dab pollen on it. it. Takes a long time just to make a single emasculation. Imagine making thousands of tons for farmers to grow and take advantage of hybridity. Can't really do it, well, until now. Now we know the benefits of hybrid vigor. I think they're well known. Corn is the great hybrid crop. It's the great hybrid crop. When they, because it's open pollinated, it was very easy to make hybrids in corn. So the whole seed production process was simple. And it revolutionized the breeding of corn. And I've just presented here um, yields, the actual yields in, hang on, hang on. Um, in corn and wheat in the US. What you note here is that the yields of corn are higher. Part of that is heterosis. They are grown in different environments, so it's hard to decouple that. But look at the rate of increase in corn compared to wheat. There's a couple of reasons for that. There is this hybrid vigor, but it's this last one, investment. Because farmers have to come back and buy the seed every year, there's tremendous value in corn. And more money is spent breeding corn than all other cereals collectively. It's an enormous investment. Imagine if we could do this with wheat, and many have. In fact, for the last 50, 60 years, people, the holy grail has been a hybrid system in wheat. But they have tried cytoplasmic male sterility. I've tried cytoplasmic male sterility. You take a wheat nucleus and you put it into a, a, a foreign nucleus and you can achieve male sterility, partial male sterility. You can kill the pollen using chemicals. You can use temperature-induced sterility. You can use transgenic systems to achieve it. <clears throat> All have significant shortcomings. And that's because sterility is not complete. You need complete sterility to make the hybrid seed. Restoration of fertility is incomplete, and you need that so the farmer has something to sell in the marketplace. The cost of maintaining the system, that sterility is really high. And there are all sorts of regulatory restrictions around using chemicals and transgenes in the environment. So there has not been an effective system for doing this. 
However, we've been able to develop this blue aleurone system. And up here, you can see blue and white seed as an example. This system is genetic, which sets it apart from all others. It was created using natural diversity. It requires no chemicals to make the hybrids. It's very easy to use. You can get complete fertility and restoration. And we have molecular tags for all components of the system. So we can reassemble this system in any background. It's very nimble. It has been a real breakthrough. How does it work, you might ask? Well, we have a wheat. You see this wheat here in the top. It has blue and white seed on the same plant. That seed is fresh. So you've got a bucket full of blue and white seed. It's then separated using a color sorter. And color sorting technology has come a long way in the last 10 years. We can do this now very effectively and efficiently. And you can separate that into blue seed and white seed. The blue seed is fully fertile. You plant it to produce more blue and white seeds. So that's how you maintain the system. Keep planting the blue seed because it produces blue and white in a one-to-one -one ratio. Although those two bags aren't one-to-one, -one, I should uh, get another photograph there, shouldn't I? But it's a one-to-one -one ratio. And that white seed is male sterile. And that male sterile seed goes off for hybrid seed production. So in this, this is a hybrid seed, hybrid seed production block. You can see this is the white ster male sterile here. So this is male sterile, female fertile. We plant fertile male plants on either side. These are the, this is the male plant that we want to cross with this one. We'll let the pollen drift across. Later in the season at maturity, we come in and harvest this. All that seed is hybrid. And that's what is sold to the farmer. How much heterosis or hybrid vigor are we seeing? We're seeing quite a lot now. This is this is percentage heterosis compared to sun top of commercial cultivar. We always measure heterosis or hybrid vigor against the best commercial cultivars. Now, when we started looking at this six, seven years ago, we did not see anything near that level of heterosis. And that's because to enjoy C hybrid vigor, you need to have two distinct pools. You've got to have two distinct pools that when you cross them together, produce an individual that has that heterosis really important. 100 years of wheat breeding had basically merged those pools together. So we've been unpicking the pools, pulling them apart. And genotyping technology has made this a lot easier. It would have been a lot harder without it. To the point now where we have many lines with high levels of heterosis. But what is key here is convincing farmers that uh, new hybrids, um, that the that, that, that Hybrids are worth looking at. So we go and farm. <coughs> Excuse me. This is an example of that, one of our new hybrids here against the leading variety in that region. And what you can see, I hope you can see, if you've got a trained eye at looking at wheat, that uh, this is, has much more biomass than the leading variety. A big difference. And this one is high yielding. Going on farm and planting large blocks like this against the variety that the farmer uses is part of getting a new technology adopted. It's important. Next year, we will be taking hybrid wheat, the first hybrid wheats ever, and putting them into the national variety trial. This is the first time there'll be a national variety trial. This is the first step to seeing hybrids released to farmers. So we're really excited by this tech. We think, we think that this could be as big as those semi-dwarf genes that came in at the beginning of the Green Revolution. Who knows? Who knows? I guess I've been recorded here, haven't I? But uh, it could be. It could be. So what's my perspective on all of this? I hope I haven't run too long. Um, our, I believe that our new genetics, these new sensing tech, if we can use these new technologies in innovative breeding strategies, if we know how to use them really well, and we deploy our varieties in these resource use efficient farming, using resource use efficient farming practices, we can limit the impacts of climate change. We really can. We can maintain farmer profitability and we can limit changes to the distribution of our crop. There is a thought that we may not be growing wheat in areas where we grow wheat today because climate change will stop that. I think we can mitigate a lot of these impacts. We have the tools to do that nowadays. I didn't have time to talk about more nutritious grain. We do have a, a significant program on the, in this space. We have a number of genetic factors associated with improved bioavailability 
um, of, of micronutrients in the human gut, as well as higher concentration of these key micronutrients. That for another time. But uh, I believe that bre we breeders need to concentrate on that. We need to make our food more nutritious. And on that note, I would like to finish with acknowledging the funding bodies who are involved with this, including the Grains Research and Development Corporation and a range of others. I'd also like to thank the many technical, farm and administrative staff here at the university who over many years have supported agricultural research. We would not be where we are today without their assistance. I know that I've thanked the different scientists or many of the scientists involved as I've gone through this presentation, but this unseen work behind the scenes makes such a difference. And finally, I'd like to thank my wife, Melanie, who has been with me every step of the way through my career as a plant breeder. Thank you very much. Very good point. And the way we've dealt with this is that I've ignored the concentration of these minerals. Um, there is a base level of, let's say, iron and zinc in wheat anyway. And there is a problem because a lot of that is associated with the alerain or the seed coat. So as you push up yield, you change the ratio of seed coat to endosperm and you dilute the micronutrient. So what people eat has lower micronutrients. So it's very hard to have high yield and high micronutrients. So we decided to look at it the other way. Um, we know that phytates bind these minerals in the human gut. If we could reduce the phytates, bring them down, we could make those minerals more available. And that is not associated with yield. That we found. So we see putting low phytate, and we've identified some genes that do this, some, some low phytate genes into our hybrid program will actually make hybrid wheat more nutritious. So there's all sorts of ways to skin a cat. Okay, well, nitrogen use efficiency. Um, it, it is a difficult one because if you want to support these higher yields, you you just so you need to you need to produce a certain amount of carbon, and you need to distribute that into grains. And you're going to need a certain degree. Of, you're, going to, you're going to need nitrogen in the system to do it. So I think that's that's fairly clear. But I think this is more of an agronomic consideration. It's more about. I think we put too much nitrogen in our systems. I think a lot of places around the world do. Certainly, from what I saw at Simit up in the Yaki Valley, they were putting so much nitrogen on the fields there that it was creating algal blooms off the coast um, with all the runoff. So. I, I'm not sure there, there, we, we can act. There, there, I have actually done a little bit of work around nitrogen, nitrogen use efficiency in wheat, and we have found some genetic systems that do enhance that. So there's nitrogen use and nitrogen utilization efficiency. They're two quite different things. But we're playing around at the edges. I actually, I actually think this is one for the agronomist working with the plant breeder. Back to our interaction. What did the DG of Simit say, Liz? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, yes, look, one of the, we've done this in wheat, and the hybrid team is planning doing this in other crops because there are some low-hanging fruit, and that's because triticale, for example, and durum wheat share genome with rare wheat. So adapting the technology to produce hybrids in those is possible, and we'll run into the same issue. We'll, we'll run into the need to start to identify heterotic groups because they're not, we tend, we've, we've actually obliterated them through, through plant breeding. That's typical of a self pollinated crop. It might, we could extend the knowledge to barley and we intend doing that as well. It's a little bit further away because we don't have that, that uh, they don't share common genomes. But uh, the bits and pieces you need to create a hybrid in barley is there. That's another self pollinated crop. I think we can take advantage. And we're even thinking of doing similar things, adapting this to vegetables and looking at tomatoes, for example, developing an effective genetic system in tomatoes. And uh, we've just been awarded a, a, a small grant through the through Souls to explore doing this in a crop like tomato. It's a very good question, often asked this one. The way the way I've always looked at this, these problems as a plant breeder is that. 
you've got to deal with traits separately. If you try and develop a phenotype by combining drought stress and heat stress, you'll end up with no genetic variance because there's just too much error, there's too much variation. So the way I look at this is we test for heat tolerance over there and eliminate other stresses so we can see the variation for heat tolerance. We test for water insufficiency over here and we eliminate temperature as much as we can and other confounding stresses like nematodes in the soil or whatever that might be. Try and get a handle on that. Once we understand the genetics, we can just simply use molecular tags, make the crosses and reassemble the new material with all of that genetics. Then we can take that to the combined stress and I'm sure we'll see a genetic variance there. And that's what we're doing. That is our objective. Yes, these, the university does, um, depending on the situation and the funding source and other things. But uh, the university does receive a royalty. And we are exploring models for exploiting hybrid wheat, for example, because this is a brand new thing. And there are, it's, a, it's it, we're treating this almost as another crop, you know, other than wheat in a way. So we're looking at models in which the university could actually receive a significant portion of that endpoint rule and having that reinvested in research. Those sorts of models are something that we need to consider more and more going into the future because, you know, the vagaries of funding, maintaining good research for long periods of time is difficult. It took 30 years to develop this genetic hybrid system. And the reason largely was the fact that the money came in ribs and drabs. And it's very hard to put that focus to keep that focus there. So yes, we are exploring new models for, for at least gaining value and plumbing that and pushing that back into this. Not the vice chancellor's people. Well, yeah, I mean, look, collections of land races are a super valuable thing. There's no doubt about it. And particularly if they're genotyped, if someone goes to the effort of providing genotypes and all of that stuff, it means every phenotype you measure can be related to a genotype and therefore to potential genetic factors associated with the trait you're measuring. So I think they're very valuable. Um, but the lines in the Watkins, Watkins collection, now I have actually looked at subsets of those, which I've obtained from different sources at different times. <laughs> yes, and looked at those for stress tolerance. But always valuable. If anybody puts a collection together, defined collection and provides that base genetic data, they're really powerful tools, whether it be rust or or uh, an abiotic stress that you're screening for. You will agree uh, that Professor Richard Trithowan is a worthy recipient of the Pogendorf Lectureship. He's in the field of plant breeding as well as Pogendorf. His uh, presentation and the data that he uh, analyzed and uh, dissected for us uh, evidence of the importance of the field, the increasing importance of the field. His answers to the curly questions posed by the audience also indicate the depth and breadth of his knowledge. So we thank Richard for his lecture tonight and wish him well as he continues his important work. Thank you, Richard.